Hi everybody, thank you for joining us here today. Today I have the lovely Sharon Bennett Connolly with me and she is taking part with Alternative August. So I'm just gonna have a very quick introduction to that in case somebody who goes, this is a Tudor page and then sees Magna Carta and thinks, why is that happening? So Alternative August is just an opportunity for us to look at some other periods and events in history. So that's why Sharon has very kindly agreed to talk with me today because she has written this book. Ladies of the Magna Carta, which is a wonderful book, isn't it beautiful? Your book is very beautiful, <laughs> very pretty. And um, so, I will put for people who want the talk. We're going to talk about Sharon's work and her book and things, and all that information will go in the show notes underneath the video. So that will be available if you want to look at any of these things. So we are talking about the Magna Carta today and the ladies of the Magna Carta. Um, obviously, initially, though, we need to take a little bit of time to find out a little bit more about Sharon herself so that you know who she is and what she does. So, Sharon, thank you again. And please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you and what you do. Um, oh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> you start. Uh, I'm Sharon Connolly, although on my books I'm Sharon Bennett Connolly, um, which is really, that's been mainly because of my... Um, Facebook name. Yeah. I use Sharon Bennett Connolly on my Facebook so that my old friends and my new friends can find me. And it just ended up being my pen name as yeah. well, rather than just Sharon Connolly, which is great when you're signing and you're just like, Sharon, oh no, Bennett Connolly. <laughs> That's a bit long. But at least that way, I, I'm noticeable easier. I'm mm. tending to concentrate on women, medieval women, um, which sort of has been was an accident really. I started writing a blog in 2015 and noticed that most of my articles about women were getting more views than about men so I started concentrating on the women and then in 2016 um, Amberley Publishers had a competition for you to get your first book published oh, and I um, thought about entering, wrote everything out that they wanted um, a synopsis of the book, a chapter plan, a 2000 word introduction, a short bio of yourself. And I wrote it all out and then I just let it sit there on my desktop. And a week before the competition was due to end, I think it was the 31st of October, the entry ended. I actually, I literally was sat on my computer and I closed my eyes and pressed enter <laughs> and sent it in. <laughs> and didn't hear anything back even after the closing date of the competition so I just thought oh I haven't, I haven't won so never mind and a couple of months after that I got an email back from an editor at Amberley saying dear Sharon um you entered this competition I'm afraid you haven't won and I'm so glad I didn't stop reading then because after that it said however we would like to publish your book anyway <laughs> and that message came through at 28 minutes past three so I read this email and then I had to pop over. My, our, my son's school is literally over the road. So 28 minutes past three, I had to pop out to pick him up <laughs> school. So I couldn't do anything, but I'm walking across the school with this massive grin on my face because I've just got this email to say they want to publish my book. But I can't tell anyone because I haven't replied to say, yes, please. So oh. I haven't got the publishing contract. I can't tell anyone. I've got this huge grin. Yeah. I get home and my mum turns up, my mum and dad turn up and I go to my mum, oh, um, I've just been asked to put, they want to publish my book and she, my mum went, that's nice dear. And it's like, no mum, that's really incredible. No, no, I don't think you've heard what I've just said. <laughs> I've just said they want to publish my book. <laughs> oh dear. Well, no, that was Heroines of the Medieval World and that was my yeah. first book that came out in 2017. And then the year after that I published Silk and the Sword, The Women of the Norman Conquest. And this year, May, the third book came out, Ladies of Magna Carta. Now, yeah. Ladies of Magna Carta and Silk and the Sword both came out of Heroines of the Medieval World, each one. Some of the women in Heroines of the Medieval World were the basis for the next book, sort right. of thing. So with Ladies of Magna Carta, Matilda de Brayos and Nicola de la Haye were both women I'd written about in Heroines of the Medieval World. Mm. and they were both such incredible women I had this kernel of an idea at the time that maybe one day I'd write more about them so with heroines of the medieval world it's chapters on specific kinds of women 
the warrior heroines include Nicola de la Haye and three other women. Whereas with Ladies of Magna Carta, it's a chapter, it yeah. was, it's sort of a chapter on each woman, except for some of them, it's a chapter on families, mm. because there were just so many women to write about with the Magna Carta links. It was a real, I thought I'd have to write about eight women, but I suddenly realised there were so many families. Yeah, literally. Women related to all these families who had either an influence on the Magna Carta clauses, were involved in the birth of Magna Carta itself, or used Magna Carta afterwards mm -hmm. to get to protect their rights yeah. and, um, and their freedoms. So it's like there's so many different women about the Magna Carta did so much about. So it's like, yeah. it, was, it was a bit of an eye opener. Even after I decided to write the book, I suddenly realized there was so much more that needed looking into. <laughs> It's, this is the thing, you, quite often you start a topic and you think, oh, there's, you know, I'm, I'm going to put this in a book. And I've heard a lot of people say this. And once I get going, I could write two books. Yes. Or, or three books. And I, I've, but I've got to draw the line. And then, that the problem yeah. then becomes not finding enough is you've just got far too much. <laughs> and, and then, like, you've got to sort of be a little bit more concise. But it does give you scope to go yeah. and do something else. Well, which is yes. Nice. And to move on, because... Um... The book I'm writing now isn't related to it, but the next book I'm going to write that I start next May is a biography of Nicola de la Haye. Nicola de la Haye was amazing. Yeah, but that literally follows through from me doing the research for this book and getting in touch with my editor while I was writing it, saying, I think I've got enough to write a biography on Nicola de la Haye. And I, I think it would be great if I could write a biography of Nicola de la Haye. When I was like, yes. um, chatting with Mike Ingram the other day, and I said, oh, I was speaking to you. And he said, make sure you ask her about Nicola de, ha de la Haye. And I was like, right, <laughs> okay then. And I was reading it. It's like, this woman did not care. She was she like, I am not having awesome. any of your rubbish from you lot. Yeah, <laughs> she was this, awesome. This, this, yeah. Now, Nicola de la Haye, she is in, she's just, <clears throat> she, the first two women in the book are Matilda de Breos and Nicola de la Haye. And they're contemporaries. They were born, both born in the 1150s they were about the same age you know so and through their lives if you look at the beginning they had very similar lives you know they married men with land um the men were well william de breos followed richard the first and then prince john and later king john and gerard de canville nicholas second husband was also a supporter of prince john so when Richard the Lionheart came to the throne, Gerard and Nicola were in charge of Lincoln Castle. Gerard married Nicola and she was the, her, her father had been hereditary castellan of Lincoln Castle. So he got Lincoln Castle by right of his wife. So when in 1191, when Richard was away on crusade and John did his little rebellion against the um, Justicia Longchamp, um, Gerard de Canville supported John and went and met John at Nottingham Castle to help the rebellion. In the meantime, William, nasty William Longchamp saw an opportunity that Lincoln Castle was undefended and decided to come north to get William, get, to get Lincoln Castle and give it to one of his own supporters. The problem was he didn't actually reckon on Nicola, who, yes, Gerard might be the bloke in charge, but it was her castle. Yeah. <laughs> and she defended it for six weeks. For 40, 42, 40 days, it says in the books, they actually know because um, the records are there that the um, people attacking the castle were paid for 40 days yeah, during yeah. the siege. So we know that she defended it. She held them off for 40 days. Um, by which time... He, Impressive he, by anyone's standards. Yeah. Yeah. And John John just gave up in the end because he could not get her out of there. And it's, that's when he said um, one of the chroniclers said she conducted the defence by not doing anything womanly because they couldn't praise they couldn't yeah, they, praise yeah, they could have yeah, 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 to make her less than a woman or, or a man or, yeah, <laughs> yeah it had to be a little bit unnatural or something a bit strange about her yeah. yes we'll come back unfortunately to as a result when king richard came home gerard and nicola were kicked out of there on their ears <laughs> No, it, it's just always the way, isn't it? You well, can't. this is the thing about King John. You know how we say, everybody says King John's bad King John. 
Nicola and Gerard were relieved of their relieved of Lincoln Castle and they had to go to their live on their own estates for about six years during Richard's reign. <clears throat> but as soon as John came back to the throne, they were reinstated. They were given back Lincoln Castle. Yes, yeah. And that was one of the things with John. Yes, he was bad, but if you were loyal to him, he was actually loyal to you for the yeah. most part. Yeah. And you look at that and you think, oh, well, that's why. And then you look at Middles of the Brayos, who her husband was loyal to John. <laughs> yeah. But then John turned against him because he had the se- he knew the secret that John didn't want out, which was that Arthur had been killed on probably on John's orders rather than on John with John's hand. So Matilda de Breos and William, <coughs> they had been supporters of John all through John getting the throne. Um, through John defeating Arthur, William de Breos was actually the man who caught Arthur at uh, Mirabeau when he was um, besieging his grandmother and presented him to King John and John put him in prison and then at Rouen at Easter he um, decided he wanted to get rid of Arthur and um, Arthur was killed in some way and his body thrown in the Seine. Um, William was there and John knew William was there and William knew John's secret and all through that you know how they say about with the princes in the tower why didn't somebody say when Richard just admit that he killed them. John never admitted he killed Arthur. You're not going to, are you? No, exactly. So Arthur, he was still a bargaining tool anyway. Even a year after uh, Arthur's death, Philip of France was saying, if you, um, I want, you know, we want a treaty, but part of the treaty will be for Arthur's release. And he's like, well, Arthur's been dead a year. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> nice try. <laughs> can't tell you that. <laughs> nice try. Um, exactly. Okay, so... The Magna Carta itself, I think a lot of people have obviously heard of Magna Carta um, and know that it's, it's still considered, even though, you know, how long ago it was made, it's still considered a really relevant document today because it's featured in a number of constitutions. And yeah. uh, we have an unwritten constitution in this country, but people... It is probably our constitution. That's yeah. the closest we've got to a constitution, yeah. Magna Carta. Although we were talking just before we started about how maybe it needs an update in this country. <laughs> a bit of reminding sometimes. <laughs> But anyway, yeah. um, so it just, uh, equal it, rights and people will probably want to have a look at it. <laughs> um, so the Reverend, um, Hon- rather, sorry, the Right Honourable Fiona Wolfe said Magna Carta, the single most important legal document in history. This is from Sharon's book, mm-hmm. foundation for global constitutions, commerce and communities, the anchor for the rule of law. Yes. Now there's 63 clauses. And if you, if, when you have Sharon's book, the whole of the Magna Carta is actually written out clause by clause in the book because it's obviously it's written on this paper and the paper or the, the skin or whatever that was written on was very expensive and valuable. So it's all written quite squishy and all the different copies, isn't it? And there's yes. no like space. And it's in Latin as well. So well, you've got no chance. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, so they've put that in. Now there's 63 clauses of Magna Carta. You mentioned in your book that only eight of them really relate or mention women gender, women yeah. you know, the female gender and there's three now that really are still the ones that we use that are, are mostly relevant to what mm-hmm. we do today and so um one is just the one one is still in use which is the one about london and then chart numbers 39 and 40 which are the basis of our criminal system yeah criminal law system so it's the right to um, sorry, I got we've got it here. There's the one that says, I've got here to no one will, um, to no one will sell, no, to yes. no one we will deny or delay right. right or justice. Yeah, and then no free man shall be taken or imprisoned or deceased or outlawed or exiled or in any way ruined, nor will we go or send against him except by the lawful judgment of his peers and by the law of the land. Yeah. So basically, you cannot. It's the fact that you cannot be imprisoned without um, being um, facing your peers first in a, in a jury trial, yeah. and the the and the to no one shall we sell is justice is blind. It's you can you know you can't buy your freedom. You yeah. have to prove your innocence, sort of thing. 
Yeah. So, so those are the two tenets of criminal law. Everything we do in criminal law comes from those two clauses. Yeah, and and the same in many many other countries yeah. as well. Yeah. So the, the big question really is, um, oh no, not the big. So Magna Carta was. When did Magna Carta come about? So that was the first thing. And um, why did Magna Carta come about? So we'd look at, we're going back to King John, aren't we? Who's your stereotypical royal baddie. But perhaps what you could see or people would see as his actions were the, sort of the danger of having an absolute monarchy. Well, it's the, danger. The, the thing is with the monarchy in the medieval times, it was a partnership. It was a partnership between the king and the barons. They each owed a duty to each other. The king owed a duty to the barons to protect their rights, to give justice evenly and without bias. And the barons owed feudal duty to the king to give him an army when he wanted to attack yeah. them, when he wanted to go to war, and to give him service in the courts, in administration. The whole administration was set up so that the barons and the lords were the ones who dealt it out regionally whereas the king was the centre of it. So the barons were the justices of the peace, the sheriffs. They were the local law enforcement in most areas. And then the king had the central government and the central justice. So he gave the justice to the, he was the law for the barons, but the barons were the law for the, their tenants and the people below them. Mm. And it was supposed to be a quid pro quo thing where, you know, you give, a little and you take a little and fortunately when John lost his continental possessions it meant that everything he needed to run justice the money he needed to run the justice system and to run the courts and to run the government and to wage war had to come from England from yeah. his vassals in England whereas before England was a small part of a very big empire so he had money coming in from Aquitaine from Normandy from Anjou yeah um from Brittany at one stage as well so he had all these different sources of revenue when he lost Normandy in 1204 that revenue was reduced and then he lost Aquitaine finally in 1212 he lost in 1214 he lost even more revenue so everything had to come from England and suddenly the barons weren't so happy about that suddenly no. they were having to pay a lot more um and but not all John wasn't bankrupt all the time. He he had um some some years he had an awful lot of money. His revenues were going up forty thousand, fifty thousand pounds in a time when years before it was just twelve thousand pounds and things like that. And that so, was phenomenal amounts of money then. Yeah, but the thing was when they had Normandy and Aquitaine, the kings could lend money to their lords for things like um William de Breos is the perfect example. He was given the county of Limerick in Ireland by John um, for a price of £5,000 or marks, pounds or marks, I can't remember which one off the top of my head. And William was supposed to pay it back. Um, except in those days when the Crown lent a Lord money, they didn't actually expect to get it back originally. But then suddenly John had no more sources of money. So yeah. money he'd lent out, he suddenly expected back. Whereas before in Richard the First reign, because they had loads of sources of money, the barons weren't exactly expected to pay it back or yeah. they could pay it back in little bits. Whereas suddenly John needed money. <laughs> and the way to do it was to look at, oh, so-and-so owes me money, I'm going to get that back, which is what happened with William de Breos. Suddenly he wanted his money back. So and so when Breos... speaking, it wasn't unreasonable. No, exactly. It's just that people had got used to just going, oh, can you lend Yeah, they're used to the crown... A thousand pounds. Yeah, they were used to the crown not chasing it, and suddenly the crown's chasing it. Yeah. And Breos didn't have the money, so John sent his... Um, one of his share, one some of his men to Breos's castle, um, to demand that Breos hand over two of his sons as hostages, um, to the repayment of the money. At this point, Matilda de Breos, she gets a bad rap for this. It's always her fault. I'm pretty sure that if somebody who'd killed his nephew came to my door and asked for two of my sons, 
Um, well, I turn around no. and say, you're not getting him. He killed his nephew. He's not yeah. getting anywhere near my sons. But she always gets a bad rap. It's like she let her mouth run away with her. And that's what caused the problem. I just think she was petrified of what was going to happen. And she didn't guard her words as well as she should have done. So she actually turned around to the king's representatives and said, no, you're not getting them. He could not, he, his nephew Arthur was killed while he was in his care and he was supposed to be looking after him. So you're not getting my sons. And this got back to John. John, not so happy, decided he would make an example of William de Breos because of course to the king, you can't have somebody you lent money to not paying you back. You've got to make sure he pays you back so that you make sure all the other people you've lent money to start paying you back. Yeah. So it was, he, he was nasty with it, but you can see his reasoning. Yeah, um, if you let one person off, then you can't go to everybody else. Yeah, exactly. They go, well, you know, somebody else would demand the money and you didn't give it to you. And you went, oh, okay, then. Then yeah. everyone else is going to do the same thing. Yeah, exactly. So uh, he also he, upset the Pope, didn't he? He did, yeah. Well, the Pope upset him as well. You see, this is the thing with John. <laughs> Let's just tell the story. story. Um, it was the Archbishop of Canterbury in... Uh, I can't remember the exact date. I think it was something like 12 or 7. The old Archbishop died. And John put forward a candidate for the Archbishop of Canterbury. And the Pope decided he didn't like that candidate. So he put forward his own candidate, Stephen Langton, and had him consecrated Archbishop of Canterbury. John didn't like Stephen Langton. So he wouldn't let Stephen Langton take his seat as Archbishop of Canterbury. And he exiled basically all the clergy, he sent Langton into exile in France. Um, the Pope retaliated by excommunicating John and putting England under interdict. Now, England under interdict means there can be no services, no church services, no burials, no marriages. Um, you can bury people, but you can't do it in consecrated ground, basically. Christenings, I believe, could still happen, but that is it. That must no, have been quite other. scary for people. For people who were fundamentally religious, yeah. for the church ruled their lives, yeah. it would have been terrifying. And John held out for about five years. Yeah, it went on. It did. Huh. And um, once the interdict was put in place, every bishop and archbishop left, except the Bishop of Winchester. Everybody else went to France. There was something like... Um, all the bishops and um, all the abbesses were, were vacant. So all the abbots from all the monasteries went as well. Mm -hmm. And there was just the Bishop of Winchester and one other bishop left in England um, supporting John. Now, Peter de Roche, the Bishop of Winchester, he was a bit of a martial bloke anyway. He was quite more happy with the sword <laughs> and wow. causing trouble than anything else. He actually turns up at the 1217 Battle of Lincoln <laughs> fighting. <Watch for it. laughs> yes. So, um, so, so yeah, um, and this tussle with the church went on and on um, until about 1212, John suddenly realised that he, it needed sorting out mm. and that he needed the church's support because, I mean, in this time, the church even backed Philip, the, Philip II of France for invading England. He said, you know, they said, if you invade England, we will support you because John's a bad guy and he's excommunicate, so you can do it. I mean, the problem was Philip II was excommunicated quite as often as John was anyway, so it wasn't going to happen. <laughs> it's interesting. The little thing all... about imprisoning his wife for a while. <laughs> well, we'll come back to the Pope because after all his being cross with John, he then steps in for him. So we'll pop back to that in a minute. No, he does. Well, this was the thing because then in 1212, John decides to thwart the barons and Philip by actually handing England to the Pope mm. and England becomes a papal thief which means John suddenly is protected nobody can do anything to England and John because he's protected by the Pope and the Pope literally does this he protects John he turns around and says leave him alone he's one of us now yeah um but it was it was a cynical move and John always did like his cynical moves um, but the barons were getting restless again, you know, 
Matilda de Breos had been chased to Ireland, Scotland, and captured in Scotland and returned to England and imprisonment, first in Bristol Castle and then either in Cork or Windsor, opinions are divided, um, with her son. Um, William de Breos agrees to pay a massive fine of 50,000 crowns that he's never actually going to be able to manage to have raised. Uh, so he dresses as a beggar and legs it to France, leaving his poor wife and son in prison. And John conveniently forgets to feed Matilda yes. and her son. Yes, yes. These things so happen. after 11 days, um, she, they are found in their prison cell with the description of it is horrendous. He is laid with his back against the wall oh, as yeah, dead. Yeah, this is horrible. And his mother is laid between his legs with her head on his chest, dead. And there are marks on her son's cheek where she's tried to stay alive, basically. There's teeth marks from his mum on his cheek where she's tried to say, you know, stay alive after he's died or he's told her to try and, you know. It's just yeah. like what those two went through in those 11 days is just horrendous. And there, this sympathy for John ends. Ends <laughs> just quite like roughly. <laughs> yeah. Um, nasty man, nasty John. <laughs> he's not popular, is he? So I, I suppose in this respect, this is why the barons, well, they may in, in you know, previous monarchs, I'm sure they know that there were periods where people were very much against each other. So um, the, the Magna Carta itself, mm -hmm. um, where, and I know a lot of people know what it is, but when and where was it signed exactly? Well, it wasn't signed. Oh, oh it was oh. sealed. It sealed. was sealed. sealed. Although you can actually, I did read Mark Morris say the other day, you can actually use signed because that's what they meant when okay. they did it. it okay, is I feel a bit better literally now. Signed. They don't mean literally using a pen, they mean they've, they've put their sign on it or their mark or their seal. So yeah, it was sealed at Runnymede on the 15th of June and 1215. Um, it was, it wasn't, it was called a Charter of Liberties. It wasn't a it wasn't specifically a great charter intended to set out the law for the rest of time. It was essentially a peace treaty. The 63 clauses are the clauses, the, the, the grumbles of the barons. These are what the barons didn't like that was happening and they wanted them sorted. So there's some really obscure things in there, like there's a there's regulation of weights and measures yeah and um, there's things about the forest laws and there's the last clause is about the evil councillors which is basically the men that were surrounding john that were doing his dirty work sort yeah. of thing and the barons who weren't those men wanted them kicked out yeah which is <laughs> oh, and, kind of understandable yeah but then again they were just as bad as each other in some ways oh, as well yeah. you know they the barons that wanted them kicked out had been rebelling for a couple of years we were talking before <laughs> we started filming this about we won't name them because but some other monarchs and and like how essentially they were all men of their time and, yeah. and products of their situations and they sometimes did some good things and they sometimes did some rotten things but they were in extreme situations mm. you know, which is not necessarily an excuse but it's certainly an explanation yeah, I mean, there's one instance where um, Llewellyn of Wales rebelled against John um, and John held 28 Welsh prisoners as hostages and he was holding them. Llewellyn decided to rebel, so John hanged the prisoners at Nottingham, all 28 of them, and some of them were quite young, only teenagers. And that's one of the worst things he did in his reign. Mm. But he was well within his rights. To do that and Llewellyn knew that if he rebelled those hostages lives were forfeit so is it John's fault for, re for hanging them or is it Llewellyn Llewellyn's fault for rebelling when he knew that if he rebelled that would those the hostages hostage. would be executed oh there's a moral <laughs> dilemma isn't it yeah that's a it's hot, just one of those things it's, there's always two sides to a yeah, story that could be debated till the end of time couldn't it that yeah one. So John agreed to this. He was like, yeah, that's fine. Um, yeah, that's all good. But the nano, well, they, they yeah. thought, right, that's it. it. It's done. It's sorted. He appealed to the Pope straight away. Well, yeah, a week later, he wrote to the Pope and said, they've made me do this. And they had literally backed him into a corner. Um, it was do this or we're going to war. 
Yeah. Um, so John wrote um, the Pope saying he's made me do. They've made me do this, and it's not fair. And yeah. the Pope's like, well, you're one of my men now. Remember, yeah, we're a papal thief. You're my yeah. man, and so you're right. It's not fair. But even before the Pope had replied, it had become all out war. Yeah, it was too. Um, John was John was besieging Rochester Castle by the time the letter came back from the Pope saying that the Magna Carta was null and void mm. and everyone who'd made John sign it was now excommunicated. Yes. <laughs> and yeah, it was basically from that moment on for the rest of John's reign, it was war. Yeah. Um, he besieged Rochester. Then the bar rebel barons invited the French king to take the throne. Yes. Which he is didn't want it. But his son Louis thought, oh, great opportunity. So his son Louis came over um, in the spring of 1216. And he was even proclaimed king in mm -hmm. London. So you could say we did have a King Louis. Um, he sent men up to, well, he occupied most of the south. John um, went up to the north, um, took Berwick, came back down south to... Um, solved the problem of the barons in Lincoln for Nicola de la Haye in 1216. Again, another siege. Um, the rebel barons, um, they were called the Northerners, the Northern barons, um, Eustace de Vesci and Robert Fitzwalter were the leaders. They besieged Lincoln Castle. Um, Nicola very cleverly this time paid them off and gave them some money and they went home. And they went into a place called the Isle of Axo, which is literally five miles north of me. Um, it's a marsh area. It's very hard to get into, but easy to defend. And okay. it was used regularly. They used it during the time of the anarchy with Matilda. And they would use it again. Um, the rebels would use it. The Simon de Montfort's rebels, Simon de Montfort's son, used it after the Battle of Evesham, so it's one of those little areas like the Isle of Ely that everyone, you know, if you want to be a rebel, you go to this <laughs> island. <laughs> it's not really an island, it's just a load of marshes, but it's very difficult to attack that. Right. Okay. So John just went in with um, blades drawn and the term is he brought fire and sword to the Isle of Axo and he basically destroyed what rebel army was there as much as he could. Then he went back to Lincoln Castle had a word with Nicola. Nicola apparently met him at the gates. Now remember, Nicola de la Haye was born in the 1150s. This was in 1216. She, she met him at the gates. Gate. Yeah. yeah, she was in her 60s. And she met him at the gates with the keys to the castle, to Lincoln Castle. She was a widow by this point as well. Gerard had died the year earlier. And she gave the keys to John and said, at my great age, I'm, you know, I relinquish my right sort of thing. And John gave the keys back and said, Nicola, I would that you keep the castle as before until I tell you otherwise. In other words, stay put, girl. You're too yeah. good. Yeah. <laughs> far, far better job than this than I have. So. Yeah. yeah, so you're staying. And then John went south, lost his some jewels in the, so lost his baggage in the wash, fell ill uh, Lynn um, with dysentery, made it to Newark and dropped dead night of the 18th or 19th of October. Mm. And just a few hours before he died, he appointed Nicola as sheriff of Lincolnshire. And she was the first ever female sheriff in England. Yeah. In 1216. <laughs> All that time. She was amazing, yeah. wasn't she? Now, John she died. Incredible. I think it's fair to say that pretty much no one cares. No, as my son will tell you, the best thing John ever did for England was die. Yes. <laughs> yeah. He dropped dead at the it, right it, moment. Wrong to say that people were upset about this. Yeah. Um, no, John dropped dead, so his nine-year-old son became king. You can't make war on a nine-year-old boy. No. So a lot of people dead. lost heart in the rebellion. Yeah. Um, the very well-respected William Marshall was made regent for Henry. Um, which is another thing, you know, William Marshall, this great. It's funny that the two great people in the story, uh, William Marshall, who was in his 70s by this point, yeah. and Nicola de la Haye, who, were in her, who was in her 60s by this point. And I always think that if these two people had been in their 30s and 40s, 
there'd be umpteen films about them. <laughs> as, as sort of heroic figures with armour and swords and yeah, long exactly. flowing and hair. And... Amazingly <laughs> strong, independent woman and the yeah. superhero knight. But no, he was in the 70s, she was in her 60s and um, he took charge, had Henry crowned, reissued Magna Carta. Yes. By this point, remember, Louis is still in England, mm -hmm. still running the South. Some of John's key supporters had already turned and gone back to, gone over to Louis, yeah. including John's own half-brother, William Longspay, the Earl of Salisbury, and his cousin, William de Warren, the Earl of Surrey. Um, they were all in Louis's camp now. Um, not for any other reason than it looked like Louis was winning. They just, yeah. you know, they were choosing the winning side. So yeah, it looked like Louis was winning, it looked, was winning, but then John dies. Yeah. And suddenly it doesn't look so much like yeah. Louis going to win because you have the great <laughs> William Marshall in charge all of a sudden. And Hubert de Burgh as his really helpful second time, second um, man of the hour. So by early 1217, they, rebels were coming back in droves in steady numbers yeah to the king to the royalist side william de warren came back probably in funny enough william de warren probably came back to the royalist side in march but he was still telling louis he was in his side until about may so like there may have been a little bit of spying going on by william de warren by the sound of it but okay. yeah that he was quite i think he was considered quite um a well respected and effective regent he was yeah he was the one man everybody could get behind he he was renowned for his loyalty yeah he had served henry the second richard the first and john and he'd served each of them until they died sort of thing he wasn't going to serve anybody else while he'd given his oath to one of them yeah and that so, oath was everything, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, it was. And when you think so many of them broke their oaths, the fact that he never did actually stood out, I think, for most of them. So why do you think he reissued Magna Carta at that point? I think it was to get more people on side. It was to say, look, this is a new reign. Um, yes, there were wrong things wrong with the last one. Um, you, we want to listen to your grievances, we want to put things right, so here's Magna Carta, this is what you thought was wrong, you know, this, let's put it right. And um, I mean, they were still at war until the following year, 1217, um, Link, the Battle of Lincoln, Louis besieged Lincoln in March 1217, so he still thought he had a chance of winning. And he had, uh, Nicola had to undergo another six week siege. Um, Louis actually asked her to surrender and she turned around and said, no, not a chance. And then you get this great scene from Marshall saying, we must rescue this most noble woman, this brave woman. So and I don't this, need rescuing from you. <laughs> some really powerful speeches about why they needed to save this woman and go and attack Lincoln. And he was so eager to go into battle, this 70 odd year old, so eager to go into battle when he got to the Battle of Lincoln, that he had to be reminded to put his helmet on before he set off. <laughs> he was really keen. <laughs> Very keen indeed. Very keen. So yeah, and then they defeated the French at Lincoln um, in a battle that lasted most of the morning by the sound of it. Um, they captured some of the rebels, they chased the French south, and then in the August, there was the Battle of Sandwich, which was off the coast of Kent. Um, that was against British ships, against French ships, bringing reinforcements for Louis. And once those reinforcements didn't arrive, Louis was in a bit of trouble. So he decided it was about time he cut his losses, mm. um, negotiated a peace with Marshall where he still went away with £10,000. They basically paid him to go home and give yeah. up the fight. <laughs> Sometimes I guess it's the lesser of two evils, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But you had poor Nicola who'd held out for six weeks um, until the Battle of Lincoln and she'd protected this royal castle and she'd done everything she could to keep the French at bay and 
just four days after that, she was relinquished of her post as Sheriff of Lincolnshire and yeah. Castellan of Lincoln, and all her position, all, all her places were given to the Earl of Salisbury. And that's a really rude end. Oh, yeah, exactly. To everything like, that she'd you? done, and and I know obviously she'd sort of she'd been a, a supporter of John, if you like, and then there was this new regime. But she had always fought yes. very valiantly, and she'd been able, as you say, to sort of use some of the clauses in Magna Carta to keep the castle for herself. She wasn't having yes. to forfeit the land yes. and things. You know, there's a, some of the clauses in Magna Carta about, you know, women not having to remarry, for, you know, yes. being with and, and not, and not, you know, being she able to have their get dowry herself. and just not sort of cast aside and have everything taken no. from them. You know, yeah. well, I've married you, so now everything you own is mine. And if mm. I die, I will then pass it on to somebody else who's nothing to do with you. And all of those things were starting to be very gradually stripped back. Yeah. It's sort of the epitome the of an example, was, really, of how that yeah. was starting to maybe move in that direction. Yeah, but the problem was her granddaughter was married to Salisbury's son. And her son, it seems may have died in 1217 so Nicola's um heir was her granddaughter yeah which was and she was married to Salisbury's son so as far as Salisbury was concerned he should have the castle to yeah. look after it for his son and heir look after but, it yeah yeah but Nicola was like I'm not having this I've defended this castle three times <laughs> successfully anyone else can do that no just me um, so she decided to stop this for a game of soldiers and marched to Nottingham to the king and said that this isn't fair. And the yep. king, and the king, I'm assuming it was Marshall actually rather than the king because he was only ten, nine at the time. Um, he was given, she was given the castle back. Mm. Quite right too. But, yes, but um, Longspay got the county. So Longspay, Longspay stayed as sheriff. Well, she stayed as Castellan and she was given the castle back and she held the castle then until she decided that she was retiring <laughs> in about 1226, I think that was. Which is incredible. Um, yeah, she, but she's an incredible woman and I, I don't think, I mean, if I'd had her marching to me and saying, look, you've just taken my castle from me, I think I'd have said, okay, thank you. Okay, yeah, sorry about that. Here's your castle <laughs> back. Please leave <laughs> in the nicest possible way. Please leave. So... I think Nicola struck me, I think, from reading your book, as, as I sort of briefly said just now, as sort of almost the epitome of what the most a woman would have been able to achieve yeah. in that period. And as we also said, you know, it, it was, she was, um, you know, it was, it was most un unwomanly what she did. Yeah. It was almost like it, the, the woman achieved something. It was unnatural and yeah. there was something a bit unusual they about They didn't her. know how to describe her. The chroniclers didn't know how to write about her because they'd never known of a woman actually doing... Women defended castles. Matilda de Breaux had also defended a castle. But to do it so successfully for so long, mm. you know, to survive two six-week sieges, um, in that time was like, it was unreal. It was unheard of. You know, women didn't hold out. They held out till somebody came, till a bloke came and said, it's all right, darling, sit yes. down, I'll sort it now. Go back to embroidery. Yeah, exactly. Yes. And, and, <laughs> and, and I'll, I'll do this. And, and she, you know, she saved really, you know, from yes. the French, you know, she, they, they, the chances of them being beaten back by that mm. were very, t you know, without yeah. her, it would have really been very easily a completely different story. Yeah, when I originally wrote the article about her, I called her the woman who saved England. And there was a big argument at the time saying, no, the Battle of Lincoln wasn't that important. And it's like, because even because after they'd won the battle, Louis didn't go home. There were still more negotiations and another battle to fight. So it wasn't that important, except it was. In that if she'd lost that battle, if Louis had won the Battle of Lincoln, it would have changed the face of the story, you know. It would have been suddenly the English were on the back foot and the French were winning in England. Yeah. Yeah. So it would have the war would have gone on for a lot longer, if nothing else. And yeah. it might have ended up being lost. You know, Marshall wasn't getting any younger. He only had another couple of years and then he was going to be dead anyway. Yeah, as we said, he was an he was an extreme you know, he'd already lived longer than most people could have hoped to by the time yeah. he stepped into the role as regent. So the fact that he was still going strong, you know, when when you get to a certain age, 
your your mortality is obviously in the back of your mind exactly and yeah. he only had he died in 1219 so he only had a couple of years he needed to get louis out of england yeah before you know and quick smart quick young king yeah so um so she, we, we've mentioned uh, matilda de, it was matilda de Brose, wasn't it yeah. Rayos. Rayos. I knew I'd pronounce Rayos. it wrong. I knew Rayos I'd... Rayos or Rose. I don't know. We don't know how to pronounce it, to be honest. Everybody does it differently. Oh, well, I, you, you know much more than me, so I'm definitely going with what you say. <laughs> definitely going with what you say. And we've spoken quite a lot about Nicola de Hay. And, and as you said, there's lots of women in your book. So if you need to know about all these women, then you have to read Chan's book. There is nothing, <laughs> yeah. there is nothing else for it. Um, but there was a couple others specifically that we said we might talk about. I was like, when I say with this one specifically, this is more than one person, but <laughs> the, the princesses of Scotland. And this one I think yes. particularly needed mentioning because we said earlier about how there were eight clauses of the original 63 that yeah. mentioned women or the, the female gender. Yeah. This one specifically, this particular clause, dealt, it didn't name them as such. No, but, but it had dealt with a situation, them. a horrible yeah. situation that they'd been embroiled in. So it was intended, therefore, to remove them from that situation and yeah. that threat and other people from befalling the same fate. Mm -hmm. So tell us about a little bit about that because that's quite interesting. Yes, the um, England had been arguing with Scotland for some time when John came to the throne, William the Lion, who was uh, King of Scotland for a very long time, was an old man by the time John came to the throne. Um, he'd been Earl of Northumberland um, before he became King of Scotland. Uh, but in a peace treaty between his brother Malcolm and Henry II, Northumberland was given back to England, was relinquished to England, but William the Lion wanted it back. When John came to the throne, he, he agreed to do fealty to John, but said, but I want Northumberland back. And John kept putting it off and putting it off and saying, <laughs> I'll think about it. We'll talk about it next time. Yes. Yeah, you know, we'll out of time. That's for next time. And yeah. always, every time they met, it was like, oh, we'll have to talk about it next time. By 12 or 7, William the Lion was getting fed up of this and um, was um, ruminating for war and helping the rebel barons you know, by um, Eustace de Vesci being accused of um, trying to kill John, of, uh, planning to assassinate John. So he ran away, he escaped to Scotland because he was married to William the Lion's sister, half-sister. So um, William had been harbouring some of the rebels and things like that. And then he decided to, he might invade England and try and get some, you know, get Northumberland for himself while John's distracted by these rebels. But in 1209, John forced a peace on William, uh, known as the Treaty of Norham. William was ill by this point. He only had a couple more years to live. And um, his son was only 11 or 12 at the time. So he wasn't going to be able to stand up to John. So William needed peace. Um, so he agreed to the Treaty of Norham, which... Um, Part of the treaty included a number of hostages being sent to England and Scotland paying £15,000 for the damages to Berwick and um, a few other castles that he'd attacked. And some two of the hostages were William's two daughters, Margaret and Isabella. And John, the treaty actually said that John would agree, would find them husbands. And he, with a suggestion that at least one would marry Henry, okay. uh, John's yeah. eldest son, who yeah. was two at the time, and possibly the other one marry Richard, who was eight months old at the time. These girls at the time were pro probably teenagers. I guess I was just about um, to say, like, ew. That's a yeah, the weird. eldest had been born before, 12, before 1196, so we don't know when exactly, any time in the 10 years between her mother's the marriage of William they need in to be making 1185. Good they need to be making good marriages a long time before those. Yeah, they were made. ready to marry. It was no, no good for them married. at all, was it? No good. The reason John wanted them was William was angling to marry them, to marry Margaret, the eldest, to someone in, to a French prince. So John wanted, if John controlled their marriages, then Scotland couldn't ally with France through yeah. a marriage with one of William's daughters. Yeah. So it was twofold. He controlled William's daughters then and controlled their marriages and any alliances that could come from those marriages. 
but he sort of promised to marry them off to his children or senior noblemen in the realm. Mm. Except by 1215, they were still unmarried hostages in England. They'd been in England for six years. Um, there was no marriages on the horizon and they were getting older. You know, mm-hmm. Margaret was at least 20 now. And um, possibly she could have been nearly 30. We don't know, but she wasn't. She and wasn't a young back then, chicken. you know. You, that would probably have been considered past. This is going to yeah. sound awful, but also, oh, well, I'm not going to marry her because you know she's getting on a bit now. Exactly. But and the French were getting really frustrated that the English controlled these two princesses yeah. and they weren't getting them married. So they ended up being part of the treaty uh, that the king would agree to find them husbands or send them home for mm. the king of Scotland, who's their brother by this point, Alexander II for him to find them husbands. And that's how they ended up in the treaty. And in the end, it didn't resolve anything for the poor girls then anyway. It wasn't until about six years later that Margaret married. Um, In 1221, she married Hubert de Burg, the justicia, who was in charge of Henry III's government, but he wasn't a noble at the time. He was given the Earldom of Kent after his marriage to Margaret. So Mm. it was a very low, marriage for yeah. margaret she married below herself which she's not actually in the magna carta actually guards against forcing a girl to marry below her station yeah. so there was some wrangling there even then to get her married to somebody who was so far below her station and then isabella then couldn't marry anyone any higher above her sister's station oh, okay. so it made Isabella's marriage prospects less because her sister had not married as high as you would expect a princess to marry so she ended up going back to Scotland um, before she was eventually married to Roger Bygod sorry Bigo it's mm-hmm. pronounced Bigo the Earl of Norfolk and um that marriage was not a successful one he was there was a lot of years between them there was about Roger was only a teenager and Isabella was about 30. Right. Um, <laughs> and Roger wasn't very, there were no children from the marriage and Roger did try and divorce her at one stage, but it didn't happen. But interestingly, both girls then basically married into the English nobility and lived in England for the rest of their lives. And their other sister, Marjorie, who was younger than them, she married Gilbert Marshall who was one of William Marshall's sons and himself became Earl of Pembroke in turn. Um, So all three sisters married English noblemen, lived in England and are buried together in London. They were buried in the same church in London. That's quite a nice end in some way. I love that touch. I think it's so tricky. Chosen or expected. Yeah, you hear so much of princesses marrying abroad and never seeing their family again and married in a church where you know where they serve where they for duty whereas these three managed to come back together yeah. were probably saw each other pretty regularly while they were in england and then were buried together i think yeah. it's a lovely touch it doesn't happen very often a little bit of compensation yeah for, for <laughs> even though they were dead poor losses <laughs> but it was just interesting that you know, obviously a lot of the clauses in the Magna Carta were kind of broad spectrums, weren't they? Yes. So it's quite interesting that this was a very specific one yeah. pertaining to, the, it didn't name them, but it was obvious. No, but it, it was said, that you know, the princesses, the daughters of the King of Scotland or something like that. So you know exactly who they are. Yeah. And, and so um, the last one, more specifically, that we haven't mentioned, that I wanted to, there's two reasons why I wanted to mention this lady, Eleanor, because firstly, she was King John's daughter. Mm-hmm. So quite a, a significant figure in this period. But also because she's married to a rather, or her second marriage was to a rather interesting chap called yes. Simon de Montfort and that mm-hmm. may have been a love match it may have been a love match um although Simon de Montfort was a bit of a um ladies man um out for what he could get maybe <laughs> sort of thing <laughs> he he needed a good marriage yeah. let's put it that way he so, was uh, Eleanor was born about the time that Magna, same time as Magna Carta literally she was either born 1215 or 1216 um the latest, I just saw some research the other day that suggests she might have been um, born after John died in 1216. 
Oh, um, yeah, I remember reading that, yeah. Hmm. So it was sometime around there, so she was very much a Magna Carta baby sort of thing, bless her. <laughs> but she was married at a very young age, um, eight or nine, mm -hmm. to William Marshall II. Mm -hmm. So the great William Marshall's eldest son, who was Earl of Pembroke by that time. Mm -hmm. And she was married to him uh, at a young age. Um, she fell in love with him by the sound of it. She was, you know, she must have been, I mean, she was a teenager when she started living with him. So she was probably besotted with this, you know, heroic yes. soldier. It was quite a cat, um, really, wasn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So when he died, she was about 15 or 16 and she took him, you know how teenagers are when first love, you lose your first love, you, even if they just fall out with you, it's the end of the world. Well, well yeah. she thought it was the end of the world when William died. And um, so she took a, in front of the Archbishop of Canterbury, she took a perpetual vow of chastity, in which he even put a ring on her finger to say that she was a bride of Christ. She didn't become a nun, but she was supposed to remain chaste for the rest of her life. Uh, 15 or 16, apparently her mate, her, the lady, her governess persuaded her to it. I thought it'd be a good idea they'd both do this because um but you're like thinking this you you look at it now you're going that's never gonna last yeah, it's not gonna happen no no um, it didn't because in 1238 she met well 1237 she met simon de montfort who'd come over to england to um seek his fortune his brother had signed over the rights to leicester to him mm. which he had through his grandmother who was um a uh, sister of the last Earl of Leicester. Um, the lands were split between sisters. Um, the sister, the wife of Sayer de Quincy, one of the rebel barons, and the Earl of Chester also had a claim to these Leicester lands as well. So Simon, Simon managed to claim the lands that belonged to his grandmother, but he couldn't claim the earldom because the Earl of Chester wanted the earldom as well. So it was everybody wanted this earldom of Leicester. Um, Simon desperately wanted it. And Simon was big with Henry. You he are. was a good friend of Henry, you know. Oh, Henry, you're such a lovely chap. Oh, Henry, you and me are best mates. Oh, Henry, I like your sister. Henry, will you <laughs> let me marry your sister? And Henry's like, well, actually, nobody's going to like you marrying my sister because you're a foreigner. So you'd better do it quietly. So Henry arranged for them to get married in secret in January 1238. Unfortunately, the secret didn't last long. As they don't. <laughs> no, no, exactly. <laughs> and when they married, it didn't help the fact that Eleanor appeared was pregnant the following month. Uh, uh, <laughs> so right, you can't really it. hide it when you're yeah. starting to show. Um, and Henry III's brother, Richard Earl of Cornwall, was not happy with the fact that his sister had married Simon de Montfort, this hated foreigner. People didn't like these poor newfangled foreigners coming in and getting an influence with the king. So um, it caused a bit of trouble. Simon had to go off to um, Italy, to Rome, to get a dispensation from the Pope to say that retrospectively that he could marry Eleanor because Eleanor had made a vow in front of the Archbishop of Canterbury that she would remain chaste. So he had to go and get this dispensation unfortunately he had to pay out a lot of money to get this dispensation and he had to borrow more money and apparently when he borrowed the money he said oh it's okay the king is a good friend of mine he knows I'm good for it so I'll put him down as my guarantor and um, this was going to cause trouble later because Henry didn't like being put down <laughs> as a guarantor for this money. Henry was bad enough at spending money on his own anyway. He didn't want somebody else spending his own money as yeah. well. Yeah. So this was the problem with Simon. He didn't have much money in the first place. He came into his Leicester lands. They were sort of enough. He hoped that by marrying Eleanor, he would get some more money because Eleanor was a widow of William Marshall. And thanks to Magna Carta, she was entitled to a, a dower of a third of the Marshall lands. Mm. Unfortunately, she couldn't actually get hold of a third of the Marshall lands and had to settle for £400 a year, which was paid sporadically anyway. So she didn't actually get a lot of her dower. She should have had about £1,000 and she ended up with £400. Mm. So, Simon and Eleanor were always short of money. 
then Henry decided to, when Henry got married, he was very kind. He was, often, he was kind to people. If somebody came over to England and asked for a bit of money, a bit of land, he'd give it out to them. So he'd done the same with Simon de Montfort. Yes. Then he did the same with his wife's in-laws, the, his wife's family, the Savoys, Savoyards. They came to England seeking their fortune. He made one into a bishop and he gave others land and that. Um, one got the earldom of Richmond and things like that. And then his half siblings decided to come and try their luck in England. So his Lusignan family. Um, one became the Earl of Pembroke after all the marshals died out. Yes. Um, another one was married to John de Warren, the Earl of Surrey, his, um, Henry's sister Alice, the Lusignan. And all these times, every time some foreigners came in, the English lords would get riled up and complain and you know, start going, this is not fair, and grumbling. And in the end, Simon became the leader of the rebel barons, grumbling about all these foreigners um, taking up lands, marrying our, you know, marrying heiresses and things. And um, then about the fact that Henry wasn't exactly ruling the kingdom how they wanted it ruled. And then there was a disastrous mission to try and recover Aquitaine, um, where Henry thought he'd get his mother's help and her new husband, Hugh de Lusignan. And at first, Hugh and uh, Isabel said, yes, we'll help, and um, sided with Henry. And the problem was then, once Henry was over there, they suddenly decided that they'd actually better, that their interests were better served with siding with the French king. So suddenly Henry was on the back foot yeah. and he lost more land in Aquitaine rather than gaining land. It all rather backfired on him, didn't it? It did. And suddenly the English barons were up in arms, literally in arms. Again. And yeah. <laughs> um, you had the Battle of Lewis where Simon de Montfort's men um, came face to face with the king and the Lord Edward, who was the future Edward I. Um, Edwards gets the blame for the defeat at Lewis because his army, they attacked the de Montfort's army. Um, some of de Montfort's men turned and fled. And instead of standing and holding and carrying on the fight with the main army, Edwards' men decided to chase the ones who were fleeing because they were the Londoners who'd insulted his mother and pelted her with rotten fruit one day. So he decided to chase the Londoners and punish them. And by the time he came back to the field, the rest yeah. of the royalists had lost and were, the king was holed up in Lewis Priory, um, surrounded by Simon de Montfort's men. Um, a few of the English lords who were on Henry's side had fled because they'd seen what was happening. Their, their own contingent had been defeated. So they left the field. Um, John de Warren, the Earl of Surrey among them, they went to Reigate Castle and then on to exile in France because they knew all was lost. Yeah. So Henry and Edward were now in Simon de Montfort's hands. And then Simon de Montfort, this was the period where he was effectively ruler of England. Yeah. And so he called the Great Parliament, which was the first English Parliament that included a House of Commons. He asked for representatives from every town in England to attend the parliament, which is where Simon de Montfort is known as the father of the, how, of the as the father of parliament. And um, he reissued Magna Carta in 1265. Um, but then things started going bad for him. The exiles who'd gone to France came back and landed in Wales. Edward was out riding one day with his guard because he was still imprisoned. He was out riding one day with his guard and he challenged them to a horse race. And when they stopped at the end of the race, he just carried on racing. <laughs> Literally just went. <laughs> joined up with his own men. And that was the... quite foolish, really, wasn't it? It was. It was, it was like, oh, he... <laughs> hold on, he's not stopping. It yeah. must have been a great sign. Come I... back. <laughs> Yeah. I think we've made a mistake here. Uh, yeah, I didn't think that through very well. <laughs> no. No. Oh dear. 
So, so that ended with the Battle of Evesham, where Simon de Montfort was killed. Mm. Eleanor, at that point, was defending Dover Castle, um, for holding Dover Castle for Simon. Um, she had actually been um, custodian of Edward for some of the time he was in prison, and of Edward's cousin, Henry of Almain, who was also Eleanor's nephew. And the thing with this was, it was all family. Yes. You know, Eleanor and Simon were Henry's sister and brother-in-law. Henry's brother Richard was also imprisoned and looked after by Eleanor. Um, their sons, Simon's sons, uh, Henry, Simon, Richard, um, Guy and Amory, were cousins to Edward, the Lord Edward, Henry's son, and to Henry of Almain, who was Richard's son. And they were all cousins and it was a bitter, bitter war that just tore this family apart. Yeah. So that when Eleanor, who was old, holding Dover Castle, she was informed of Simon's death, the death of her husband and her eldest son, basically on the same day in this battle. And um, she went into mourning. She shut herself away for 10 days, apparently, and nobody saw her and she must have mourned dreadfully. And then she came out after 10 days, still in her widow's weeds, but ready to defend the castle. And they had to negotiate her surrender. And she negotiated for her to, be, to surrender and to go into exile in France with her daughter, Eleanor. And um, she'd already sent her sons over to France with most of the Montfort money. Uh, another son, Simon, was in the Isle of Axome, you know, the famous Isle of Axome that had fire yeah. and sword under yeah. John. Well, Simon was there now trying to do, trying to hold out for as long as he could until he eventually went to France as well. But yeah, it must have been absolutely bitter time for them because this was a family feud and Eleanor was sent into exile and Edward, it took years for him to forgive her. She was, that was 1265, she went into exile. He went on crusade in 1270 um, was heading back from crusade when he heard that his father had died in 1272. He was in Italy, I think. And he traveled back through France and met Eleanor in 1273 and was persuaded by the queen of France to show a little bit of compassion to her. Mm. And he gave her some money and a letter saying, you know, it's all right, you know, we'll let you back into the king's peace sort of thing. But it must have been, she died over in France. She never came back to England. Um, her two, two of her sons were castigated by the church because in Viterbo in Italy, they came across Henry of Almain in church. And um, Simon, it was, and Guy de Montfort attacked him and killed him. Oh, dear. So they basically, I mean, it's always described as they killed Edward's cousin, but he was, Henry was their cousin as well. Yeah. You know? <laughs> it, it adds that sort of extra layer of tragedy that it was a family affair, if you like. It does, It's, it's yeah, tragic because, anyway, but, you know, it, it, it comes to that yeah. within a family. And then you have Eleanor's daughter, Eleanor, also known as Eleanor de Montfort, so it gets really <laughs> confusing. It does, um, always. Simon, in 1263 or 1264 or 1265, had decided, had suggested to the Prince of Wales, Llewellyn of Griffith, uh, the great Llewellyn's grandson, that he marry his daughter, Eleanor de Montfort. But then Simon got killed at Evesham, so the marriage was sort of put aside. But then, um, in, um, later on in the 1270s, it was Llewellyn decided, was trying to get back at Edward, so decided that actually, if I marry Simon de Montfort's daughter, that's gonna upset Edward. Yes. So he arranged, he suggested that, that they do, that they get on with the marriage. And um, Eleanor's mum agreed to it, and then she died, but then Eleanor de Montfort decided, went through with the marriage. They had a, um, a proxy marriage, where she went into a church in France, and he went into a church in Wales, and they swore to be married. And then she was escorted to Wales by her brother, Amory. The problem was they were captured off the English coast and underneath the boards of the ship, they found the Amory, the de Montfort flag and coat of arms. 
arms, money, and basically enough to give Edward belief that they were actually bringing support to Llewellyn to start fighting against Edward. Yeah. So Anne-Marie was imprisoned for, in Corfe Castle for what would be six years. Eleanor was taken to um, Windsor Castle and held in com comfortable confinement, they call it, um, and basically prevented from marrying Llewellyn for a good number, number of years. Mm. Um, Llewellyn had to sue for peace because he lost, so he sued for peace, and it was agreed that Llewellyn could marry Eleanor, but on Edward's terms. And Edward literally he gave Eleanor away at the altar sort of thing. He arranged the marriage, he paid for the wedding. And unfortunately then Eleanor and Llewellyn, um, they had one child, Wentley and Eleanor died giving birth to Wentley. Mm -hmm. And a few months later, um, this was June 12, 20, 1282, she gave birth to Wentley. And a couple of months later, Llewellyn was killed in battle, or actually in an ambush. And Edward took little baby Llewellyn, who was only, when Leon, who was only six or eight months old, and put her in a monastery um, in Lincolnshire, Sempringham Priory, uh, along with her cousins, who were all little girls. They were put in different priories as well. So that about not being imprisoned except by judgment of your peers in yeah. Magna Carta, doesn't apply to royal women. <laughs> and, and that's really, yeah, and this is the thing, it was supposedly all about the, the common man or whatever, but actually it should have applied to everybody. But yeah. in those sorts of tussles, anywhere from like disagreements to all-out warfare, in those echelons of society, it, whoever had the power at the time, and that could shift, mm. but when, they, when somebody had that power, that was it. You could have yeah. 20 Magna Cartas and it, it yeah. would make it. Exactly. Sense. So I will say I live in Leicestershire and you do see the name de Montfort come up. Yes, still. there's like, a whole university, is <laughs> Yeah, there is, is like the main one because I, I'd lived here and I remember reading um, something quite a while ago. I think it might have been one of Peter Ackroyd's books where he did a series and he's kind of charting from sort yeah. of 1966. Well, I can't remember the name of the series now, but it was the first book. I'm thinking, oh, de Montfort you know because I didn't grow up around here and that mm. was sort of starting to put all these things together really yeah. sort of. so he's like he's quite an interesting chap isn't he he it's, is but you see I'm, I'm, a lot of people think of him as a superhero and he was made they did try and make him a saint afterwards you know apparently um I was reading David Pilling's book Rebellion Against Henry III and there was this they did try and um start this cult of Simon de Montfort and he's his foot was encased in silver and they made a shrine of him and that That's and it's really like quite horrible and I'm, I'm just there thinking yeah but he was all like readers he was in it for the money <laughs> you know he, he, that's how he started but um, I mean he probably did his thing was getting the common man into the parliament mm. starting the house and, of commons and, that, and that's what he's remembered for and that's yeah, great that is very but the, bit, the rebellion bit i'm not so on his side of <laughs> uh but then we just go back to the same thing again they were all characters of yeah, their time exactly. and they were fitting in and they all had obviously their own personalities and their own agendas but it fairly much amounts to trying to get ahead trying to stay ahead yeah. looking for a good match trying to get and retain is because even once you've got land or money whatever it is then retaining it was a whole other oh yeah thing, so. especially if you're a woman as well i mean a lot of the, the clauses in magna carta that are to protect the women are actually they're not about protecting women they're about protecting inheritances yes yeah that will eventually pass on to blokes not women <laughs> yes. so it's about keeping the land together <laughs> And there's a thing in there about not being able, not selling land off yes. that belongs to the woman. Because if you're a second husband and you decide to sell land off, you're actually selling land off that belongs to your wife's son from her first marriage. Yes, exactly. And that's so not it's fair. protecting inheritances and protecting wards and protecting and allowing women. I mean, one of the rules is that um, she can stay in her husband's home for 40 days. 
Mm. The only reason they put that in as a clause is because people, if a woman's husband died, she got kicked out on her ear straight away. Mm. <laughs> so they had to do this to protect her, to give her yeah. time to find somewhere to live. I mean, then, it seems inconceivable to us now that that wouldn't yeah. have been an obvious thing to do. Don't just kick her out in the street because her husband's dead. But mm. that's just sort of what happens. And yeah. as you say, it's a shame that they put something down. like that to make them go, actually, that probably shouldn't happen. Yeah. So. And there's the clause that's like, she can't be forced to remarry. And it's like, so they forced women to remarry mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's that they could get hold of her land. Sort yeah, of thing. literally. Just there's that. things like that you're just like thinking you look at there, there's one clause that you look at is totally negative about women which is the one where a woman is only allowed to give evidence in a murder case if it's against her husband and that's because they were having women giving evidence in murder cases a father or a brother would ask a woman ask his daughter or sister to say i saw this that happened right, because okay. a woman could not um take part in a trial by combat so a woman could accuse somebody of murder and there's no redress you know there's no justice right. sort of thing okay trial cut by combat was god's judgment you know the yeah. one that won god was giving him his arm because he was right yeah so and a woman couldn't actually fight so if she was the one who did the accusing, the accuser had no redress, had no way of proving his I innocence be, yeah. by fighting his accuser. Oh, so they put that clause in there. <laughs> well, Nicola de la Haye would have been down there going, I'm up. Well, she did that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, there is so much we could talk about. This is one of the by Sharon's book. Um, because it rounded it up nicely, though. We've gone all the way <laughs> through. Nicola de la Haye. Yeah, it's a beautiful book published by Pen and Sword it's available now um as i said i will put all the information about the books and uh, your other books and um, <laughs> ways people can find you on social media and so forth in the show notes underneath the video but yeah this book is available you can buy it right now as soon as you see it yeah. you can, treat yourself treat yourself <laughs> <laughs> we've all been through a lot recently it's time to treat yourself to, and it is a beautiful yeah. book i know about these amazing women there's another sheriff in there as well not just nicola there's another one who becomes sheriff Oh, yes, yes. This is the thing. I kind of was like, okay, who do I pick and who do I not pick? <laughs> and it was really hard to, yeah. like, and then, but then also you don't want to tell, give everything away. No, exactly. You've got to read the book to find out who the other yeah, share is. You don't, want, you don't want, like, you know, epic quantities of spin. I could do that as a competition, couldn't I? Who's the other sheriff? <laughs> yes, there you go. You, you, yeah, there you go. You heard it here first. Look out. <laughs> but yeah, there, there's so many. And, and it's, it is wonderful to see, even though, you know, it's such a long time ago. But it, there were there's still women in that time that were able to stand up and say, no. Yeah. And there even were men who were putting together the Magna yeah. Carta that, for whatever reasons, might have gone, oh, some of these women have a bit of a bad time, so perhaps we should protect them. Mm. So there was, there was elements of it, it coming through there. So, yeah. you know, early I days. the thing is, it is often, it's so easy to say that women were just pawns in yeah. this time. They had no power and they didn't have a lot of power, but they did have ways to use the power that they mm. had. And that's what's remarkable about them. Nicola de la Haye did defend a castle. Yeah three times yeah, successfully yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, awesome. like and i suppose a lot of it was because women just maybe they had that power and they just didn't think that they could use it they weren't strong enough that they wouldn't win through that people would judge them as unnatural yeah. or they had to be careful how they used it because yeah. men did not like being ruled by women yeah which poor matilda had found out in the 1130s and 40s when she tried to get her throne so Absolutely. they had to be wily about the way they used power yeah and um and well there's there's and um we were talking before about i'm going to be speaking to annie whitehead soon yes yeah. a very similar theme about about um women and their power in these so early they did have years. more control over themselves before the conquest yes. you'll tell you that. they had it was yeah. actually quite interesting the Anglo-Saxon women had more freedom than Norman women. Yeah, it is this, and this is the thing. Nothing. We were talking very briefly, and I've said this to other people. Nothing ex, um, exists in isolation. Mm. It is. This is one of the reasons why I thought this would be a useful project. Is just to highlight the fact that you, you almost, you know, it's interesting to see the flow of how things yeah. change. It puts things in context that might sometimes. Oh, I wonder why women were treated like that then, or I wonder why you know that lands were handed down in this way, or 
actually it's come from somewhere yeah and i do get comments like when because all my books uh, yes the titles are about the women but the men are in there too of course and i yeah. do get, I get comments every time going oh well she's mentioned the husband and told the husband story as well and it's like well they, yeah, because it's they a husband. Part of the story the women yeah. weren't there on their own no exactly uh, you know their husbands and their fathers were part of their stories as well so you have to tell to give the whole view of the story you have to tell both yeah. i focus on the women and it's really hard i've just written a book about the warrens just about the warren earls of surrey and it's so liberating to just be able to write whatever you find because you can write about <laughs> the men and the women it's just like you can put everything down it's so liberating because yeah. when you're writing about the women you have to sit through the stories of the men and find the bits yeah. that are related to the and women and then the tell their story yeah. yeah so you do put the men in the story but you still try and you always go back to the women as yeah. well and say you know william marshall was in ireland doing this oh then he went to england but his wife was still in ireland still holding on to things running the estate while marshall was in england and things like that so you having to show both sides of the story yeah it, it's, you can't only talk about them the women alone because it would make no sense would it no exactly <laughs> uh, right then well thank you very much indeed thank um, you if people want to find out them. about magna carta and you've got as you've got plenty of other books so there's plenty of scope for other things in the future yep um so yeah and and certainly I, i'm sort of finding going this far back really really interesting uh, i'll get you hooked <laughs> oh no i think i think you already have <laughs> and so yeah I, I i'm really really enjoying doing this and but you are busy writing and um we have both exiled our families to other parts of the house somebody needs a call <laughs> we, we will now release them back into the wild and the child um, needs a ps4 bless him <laughs> so so thank you everybody for watching um i'll let you know as i said how you can get hold of um sharon if you would like to have and ask her any questions or find out more about her yep. and her books and so on and so forth and thank you so much again and take care bye bye thank you very much bye, bye.